Chris Sewell here, baseball card collector, investor, dealer in that order. Welcome everyone. Today we're going to do an intro to soccer cards video, uh, basically just a beginner's guide. You know, I, I should say up front, I don't consider myself an expert on soccer cards, but I, I've uh, learned a lot over the last couple of years. I've been buying a ton of soccer cards. As I just see, you know, soccer is having great long-term sort of growth potential. I absolutely love the World Cup. It's my single favorite sporting event. Uh, but beyond that, I really don't follow much soccer. You know, I'll, I'll watch the big matches when they're on or, or the U.S. national team when they have a game. But that's really, really about it. But uh, I'm going to run through the background on some of the soccer leagues uh, at first and then go through their history of soccer cards. And, and the last maybe half of the video or so is going to be about modern soccer cards and which players and, and sets to look out for. And I should say up front that this is, video is really intended for an American audience. So uh, my apologies to any European viewers when I do things like call Panini stickers, you know, oddball items. All right, before we get to the cards, I'm going to run through some uh, things you should know about the the soccer leagues. Just just the basics, you know, you don't need to know much, but I found that these uh, knowing some of these basic things really helped me when I was sort of learning the the soccer card industry. So so I'll mention a few of them here. It's very different than the big four American sports. There are just so many more professional soccer teams uh, that it can be very confusing. You know, whereas in the NFL, there's just one league and 32 teams you know in soccer there's literally hundreds upon hundreds of leagues and thousands upon thousands of professional soccer teams in addition to the many leagues around the world there are tournaments played both at the club level meaning teams from different leagues competing against each other and also at the national level where players can only play for the nation for which they are a citizen uh, the world cup is the biggest of these but there are other big ones as well so whereas like tom brady or say mike trout won't play any competitive football or baseball outside of the NFL or Major League season for the most part. A professional soccer player will play his entire team's uh, league season, uh, probably additional tournaments with his club. And then on top of that, you might play, you know, uh, important tournaments and qualifying matches for his country as well. We see this sometimes in the American sports, uh, for example, when top NBA players participate in the Olympics. But there is a, a lot more of these sort of important tournaments going on with soccer. The biggest leagues in the world are mainly in Europe. According to this website, globalfootballranking.com, currently the strongest league in the world is the Premier League in England. Some of the most famous teams in the Premier League include Manchester City, Chelsea, Arsenal, Liverpool, and others. The second strongest league is in Spain, known as La Liga, and it includes FC Barcelona, Real Madrid, and Atletico Madrid. Then there's the Bundesliga in Germany, featuring Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund and others. They currently rank third. The top league in Italy is ranked fourth and is known as Serie A. It includes AC Milan and Juventus. The French League is currently ranked 5th and known as Ligue 1. It has recently been dominated by Paris Saint-Germain, also known as PSG. There are lots of other notable leagues around the world, including in Portugal, the Netherlands, Brazil, and Mexico. Major League Soccer, the top league in America, currently ranks as the 14th strongest league in the world, again, according to this website, which, you know, seems credible to me. Each of these leagues has a winner or, or a champion every year, just like in the American sports. And in addition to that, there is a yearly tournament known as the Champions League, which features all the top teams around Europe. This is really the event that features, you know, more than any other, most of the top teams in the world all playing in the same event. So it's considered the most prestigious soccer event in, in the world at the club level. At the national level, the World Cup is held every four years and is the most watched sporting event in the world. Other tournaments held at the national level include the Euro Cup, Copa America, the Asian Cup, the Olympics, and the Africa Cup of Nations, but there are many more in addition to the ones I just named here. The leagues are set up somewhat differently than the American sports, and so some of the concepts are really interesting. That would be uh, a cool discussion, but we'll save that for, for another time. Just some of, the, some of the differences to be aware of is the European leagues include relegation, where the lowest performing teams can actually get demoted out of the top league. Uh, you know, imagine if that happened in the NFL. Cleveland goes 1-15, and and they get kicked out of the NFL for a year. They basically have to earn their way back in. You know, meanwhile, top performing teams at some of the lower level leagues can get promoted into the top league. So which teams are in each league changes from year to year. Free agency is done entirely differently. I don't, I don't really fully understand it, but teams can even loan players to other teams for a short stretch. Uh, like I said, I don't really have a a full grasp on it yet but uh, the soccer leagues tend to put a lot more emphasis on the regular season there's no sort of expanded uh, you know playoff system where you know up to half half the teams make the playoffs uh, as there are in the, in the american sports but enough about the leagues let's get to the the cards we'll start with vintage and, and work our way forward we won't talk about vintage very much as there's really not a whole lot to talk about before the 1990s there was really no standard card set i mean there's oddball stuff all over the place but no sort of standard brand making a standard card set on a yearly basis. 
The only sort of exception to this is Panini, which regularly produced Panini stickers. They were very popular in Europe, so they can, they can hold a lot of value. Prior to the 1990s, the biggest names in soccer are Pele for Brazil and Maradona for uh, Argentina. Pele first appeared on cards in 1958, and he actually has a lot of different cards through the years, but basically all of them are rare. Some of his rookies from 1958 have commanded big money, uh, reaching into six figures. Maradona first appeared on cards in the late 1970s. His early cards can uh, also command big bucks. You can think of Pele and Maradona as, you know, Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle, if you will. Some of the other big names from the, the vintage years include uh, Johan Cruyff, Franz Beckenbauer, and Stanley Matthews. Because of all the oddball stuff, defining what a rookie card is in vintage soccer is, is much harder than it is in, uh, in the American sports. You know, often what is officially a rookie card is, you know, sometimes up for debate. Panini stickers and oddball brands continue through the 80s and into the 90s. Uh, Zinedine Zidane, Marco Van Bastian, and David Beckham are just some of the many big names from the era. Uh, and then we see some of the first traditional sets in the early 90s with Upper Deck and Score, but they don't really catch on and, and these sets still really aren't worth a whole lot today. From 2000 to 2013, there are more sort of oddball stuff. You know, Mundi Chromo makes yearly sets for a while, with, which have some value. And Panini starts making more regular sets. In addition to the Panini stickers, they start making Panini World Cup sets every four years, Panini Euro Cup sets, and, and others. And most of these sets were distributed only in Europe, which had a, a, you know, a much smaller card community than in the U.S. So they are much rarer than baseball or football cards from those times. The soccer cards have, have never gone through some sort of junk wax era. It's in this time period where we see the next two greats of the game, Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. Both are still active today, and while they are you know, both in the back half of their careers for sure, they're still top-tier players in the game today. Think of them as LeBron James and Tom Brady. You know, I've not seen an all-time rankings list that does not have Pele, Maradona, and Lionel Messi as the top three players of all time in some order, and Cristiano Ronaldo is always in the top ten, and usually he's more like around fifth. Messi's rookie cards are from 2004, and he has a few of them. They command uh, big bucks and can reach into six figures in high grade. Ronaldo's rookies are from 2003, although he has a Panini sticker from 2002. Some of the other big names from the era include Ronaldinho, Wayne Rooney, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, and Thierry Henry. 2014 is really where the modern soccer card market begins, and again, I'm saying that with an American audience in mind. I'm guessing, you know, European collectors would not feel that way, but the 2014 Panini Prism World Cup set was the first major set to be mass released within the U.S. and have an impact, at least as far as I understand. You know, value-wise, it didn't really catch on until recently, but it was the first of its kind in terms of a U.S. release. It has everything we know about the Prism sets from the other sports, you know, silver prisms, serial numbered colored prisms, inserts, etc. It has Messi and Ronaldo and, and a ton of major stars, including Neymar, Thomas Mueller, Paul Pogba, Jean-Luigi Buffon, Luka Modric, Andres Iniesta, Eden Hazard, Karim Benzema, and a, ben a bunch of others. For many, it's the first card Americans ever saw of these players. It's not hard to imagine that this set would kind of be like the 1986 Fleer basketball set down the road. You know, the first of its kind and just loaded with all-time great rookies or rookie-type cards. When people ask me what's a good soccer set to invest in long-term, the, the, the first thing I point to them is the 2014 uh, Panini Prism World Cup set. From 2015 to present day, more and more standard soccer sets have been produced each year. Select came along in 2015, very similar to select sets in the other sports, with color prism parallels that are serial numbered and different tiers within the base sets. Tops and Donruss also entered in 2015, and before you know it, we have Donruss Optic, Finest, Tops Chrome, and a bunch of additional sets from Tops and Panini. Tops and Panini both have licensing in various soccer leagues, so the sets produced today are actually very similar in brands to the American sports, except that it includes both Tops and Panini. Tops often produces sets based on just one specific league. For example, Tops MLS or Tops Chrome Bundesliga. You know, be aware that these sets will be lacking many of the world's stars since they only include players from that particular league. Lionel Messi, for example, he does not play in the MLS nor in the Bundesliga, so he would not be in either of those sets. The best advice I can give as to what brands to target today, you know, soccer is still in its infancy, so kind of hard to say, but I would guess the same brands that you would target in the American sports, Topps Chrome, Panini Prism, Donruss Optic, maybe Finest or Select, you know, Refractors and Prism Parallels are always good. Rookies and serial numbered cards are, are, are better than not. High-end products such as National Treasures and Immaculate uh, exist as well. 
Because there are so many leagues and so many tournaments, there are just a lot of relevant names in soccer. Already mentioned Messi and Ronaldo as the all-time greats who are still active and elite. Nationally, they play for Argentina and Portugal, respectively. Some of the other big veteran stars in the sport today include Neymar of Brazil, Kevin De Bruyne of Belgium, Robert Lewandowski of Poland, Harry Kane of England, Thomas Mueller of Germany, Mohamed Salah of Egypt, Sergio Ramos of Spain, and Sadio Mane of Senegal. All of these players play for elite club teams in Europe as well as their country's national team. There are many, many more names that I could have added to that group that sort of fall into this category. Here are some of the top young players in the game, and this is where you see some big-time card values in ultra-modern. Kylian Mbappe is considered a top five player in the world already. At age just 22, he's already won three league titles for PSG, uh, the French Player of the Year Award, and the World Cup with France in 2018 as a teenager. Erling Holland of Norway is just 21 and is already considered a top 10 player in the world. He currently plays for Borussia Dortmund in the Bundesliga. And like in all sports recently, there's just a lot of prospecting going on. Soccer is no exception. Some of the younger, you know, less proven players are seeing some big card prices, including uh, Ansu Fati, Phil Foden, and Mason Greenwood. I, I don't really follow this category at all, so I can't really, you know, weigh in on it much. And then there's Christian Pulisic, who is 23 and the first American I've named in this video, although more to come shortly. He plays for Chelsea in England and, of course, the uh, U.S. national team where he has already been the captain. And while he is certainly not a top, you know, 10-ish player in the world, he is probably borderline top 50 player in the world, somewhere around there. And this may be the first time in the history of U.S. soccer that you could say that about a male U.S. player. You know, maybe Landon Donovan at one point, although that would have probably been a stretcher. Perhaps one of the U.S. Uh, goalies may, may have been borderline top 50, but realistically, never a field player. And again, he's only 23, so still hopefully on the rise. At the time of this recording, the U.S. national team was ranked 10th in the world by FIFA, which seems surprisingly high to me. They're ranked ahead of countries like the Netherlands and Germany, but I have to imagine the U.S. would be significant underdogs if they had to face off against you know, Germany, for example. But there is certainly a lot of promise with the U.S. team, which is a lot younger than it's been in recent years and has some quality young talent. They have been very strong through 2021 as they get ready to uh, prepare for the upcoming 2022 World Cup qualifiers. All right, last thing I'll touch on, and I, di I didn't really mean for this to be a footnote, but uh, there's not a lot of cards of them, so uh, it sort of is here. If you follow my channel closely, you know I'm a huge fan of the U.S. women's national team as well, in addition to the men. And I went to the World Cup final in 2015 in Vancouver, saw them win the World Cup, and I went to some World Cup games in France in 2019 as well with some friends, and cards for women's sports have seen some big-time sales over the last couple of years. Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka and tennis come to mind, but uh, soccer is one of the, the big ones as well. Remember that 1994 Upper Deck set I mentioned earlier? This set is loaded with all-time greats, but the most valuable card in the set by far is Mia Hamm, considered by many to be the best female soccer player of all time. Uh, PSA 10 copies of this very plentiful card go for four figures. The U.S. women's national team has won back-to-back -back World Cups and has been dominant for a long time. They don't have a lot of soccer cards, although they are starting to get more and more each year. Some of the big names to, to know are Alex Morgan, Carly Lloyd, Megan Rapino, Rose Lavelle, Tobin Heath, Kristen Press, uh, Julie Ertz, and Crystal Dunn. But all right, that's it. You know, that was a lot of stuff to cover in one video. I uh, hope you found it helpful or enjoyed. You know, please let me know in the comments if you... Uh, like this, I can make follow-up videos, you know, looking at more specific aspects of soccer cards or specific eras or or whatever. So, I, you know, I get a lot of my inspiration and, and video ideas from the comments. Always, always appreciate that. But thank you, everyone, for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and uh, see you again real soon. Thanks, guys.